Hello class, welcome to lecture six. This is a pre-recorded pre lecture that you can watch at your leisure um, because I am out of town. Um, and so the first thing I want to do before we get into the dual oscillation model, um, I, I'm going to uh, wrap up our discussion of the phase response curve. So we kind of went through things uh, fast at the end of class when we constructed our own phase response curve. And I want to make sure that I go over into some of these uh, finer points in detail. So first, um, before I talk about the phase response curve explicitly, I want to talk about phase angle, which is a term that is in the text um, in, in our, um, and in some of the papers that we've read. Uh, and it can be a source of confusion. And so I want to make sure everyone's on the same page because uh, the, the definitions are always unsatisfactory, at least to my way of thinking. Um, but, but it's a relatively simple concept. And so phase angle is simply how far apart two occurrences are uh, within one circadian oscillation. And they could be anything like the, how far apart the um, uh, onset of activity is from the onset of the actual dark period. Um, and so first, before we, we, we could describe the distance between these two things by simply just using time, how far apart they are in time. So we can uh, describe the onset of activity, uh, which is a subjective night in a nocturnal animal, right? This, that's when they're active uh, during their subjective night. And so this takes place, say for one particular animal, one hour before the actual night phase, so whatever the environmental phase is. And so we could describe this animal as having a, a phase advance of one hour, right? But we could also describe this in angles, or as a as a in degrees, which is an angular measure measurement. And so instead of saying like one hour advanced, we could say that it's a, a phase angle advance of 15 degrees instead of one hour. So why 15 degrees? Well, that's because uh, one circadian oscillation is 24 hours. Yes. Uh, and one oscillation could also be described as 360 degrees, so a complete circle. So, you know, thinking about a, a clock, if our clock was a 24-hour clock, right, it, it comes around to where it started again. And so in the same way, degrees measure a circle like our hours measure one complete cycle. And so 15, right, is simply just I'm taking the, the 360 degrees and divided it by 24. So each hour is 15 degrees. Um, 24 times 15 gives you 360. So if something is one hour apart, it's 15 degrees. Two hours apart, its, it's um, phase angle is 30 degrees. Uh, if you have something that uh, is 12 hours apart, so something that begins like the onset of activity and then 12 hours later, uh, which may correspond roughly to the transition from dark to light depending on your latitude and the time of year. Um, that would be 180 degrees difference. All right, so now that we've got our, um, we've got this out of the way, and when you see phase angle, then you just know it's just sort of another way of saying how far apart something is in time. Uh, so let's keep going. Right, so at the end of class, this is, we, we constructed something that looks similar to this. this uh, phase response curve, which tells us uh, when an individual is exposed to light during their subjective circadian time, their subjective time, which is called circadian time. By definition, circadian time is subjective. Um, and that circadian time, as we know, is not exactly, typically not exactly 24 hours. So you have to make those adjust adjustments. Um, but this tells you sort of when you're exposed to light during your subjective time, the effects that it has on either advancing or delaying uh, your rhythm, right, by expanding or compressing your tau. So for all organisms, light pulses during subjective day have no effect, which we saw in uh, the uh, interface response curve that we generated, the, the reported dead zone. 
uh, where it's right along that zero midline. Light pulses during early subjective night results in phase delays. And light pulses during late subjective night, or you could also describe that as early subjective morning, you know, before the sun comes up. Um, this results in phase advances, and this holds true for both diurnal and nocturnal animals. So, where would a short light pulse, let's just say arbitrarily 15 minutes, need to fall in order to entrain a hamster if its tail was greater than 24 hours? And alternatively, uh, what about an individual that has a towel that's less than 24 hours? So think about that. Uh, you can pull up the PowerPoint and take a look at the phase response curve, if that helps you. Uh, and think about what the actigrams look like for an animal that has a 24-hour, or has a towel that's greater than 24 hours and a towel that's less than 24 hours. All right, so let's take a look at this uh, just hand-drawn graph here. And so hamster one, this is an individual that has a towel greater than 24 hours, right? It's slanted down and to the right uh, in its free run, uh, dark, dark uh, conditions. Uh, and so just naturally, relative to our 24-hour period, it's got a little bit of a delay every day. Right? And we could say that, you know, if this is... Uh, say a 23 hour or sorry 25 hour towel then it's got an hour delay every day and so this needs to advance in order to stay in sync with 24 hours and as I described before uh, what causes advances when do you need light to get a phase uh, a phase advance you need a phase advance during late subjective night, uh, which is what the light pulse here during LD is showing. And that entrains the animal. Uh, alternatively, individuals that have less than 24 hour periods, a towel of 23, uh, so they naturally experience uh, in advance every day. They uh, get up earlier every day. They become more active earlier. Um, a light pulse during early subjective night for this nocturnal hamster is required because they, they need a delay. Their towel needs to um, be expanded. It needs to be pushed back every day. Right. And if it's a 23 hour towel, it needs to be pushed back an hour every day in order to stay in sync with 24 hours. Now what I have here uh, is an attempt to try to explain uh, how phase delays and advancements can lead to entrainment. If you remember, entrainment is the sinking to the 24 hours and also the sinking to the specific phases. So the, the output rhythms, the activity um, is, is at the appropriate phase. Right? The, the nocturnal animals should not be active during the day, for example. Not only do they need to cycle 24 hours, but they need to cycle in such a way in which their activity corresponds with the dark cycle. And those are, those are two different things, sinking and then phase matching. And so um, let's say we're in our laboratory here, or th this could easily be um, uh, out in the wild. And so we have an organism here that has a towel of 23. Um, and so if it were to free run, it would, its, its actogram would show like a, um, a movement of going down and to the left. And they, would, they would have a natural advance every day. And say, so for whatever reason, this animal, um, let's imagine that maybe we transported it to a different latitude. So sunrise is actually a little bit different now. Right? Let's say um, it was active at 9 p.m., and so it must have been like somewhere really far north during um, uh, during the northern hemisphere, uh, uh, spring and summer. And so it naturally gets up at 9 p.m. and it doesn't see any light. And it does its little activity. Um, and for the purposes of this experiment, we're going to sort of ignore when the sun rises. Right? And so it doesn't see any, any light at all. 
and so it goes through its nocturnal activity, goes to bed before the sun rises. Uh, and so it's kind of still free running, right? If it never sees the light, it goes down into its burrow. And so since it's 23 hours, it's going to phase advance. The next morning, it will begin, its onset of activity will be uh, 9 p.m. Uh, sorry, it'll be 8 p.m. because it's advancing. 9 p.m. at the beginning, and now it's going to start at 8 p.m. So I'm on the second line here, and you can see that this phase response curve has advanced one hour. Same thing, it doesn't see any light, so it's still kind of free running. On the third night, it uh, starts its activity at 7 p.m. Uh, and 7 p.m. is right when, let's say, the sun sets, um, or it could be sort of the uh, where we lose twilight. Right, so there's no there's no light at all. So it it wakes up right when the light has disappeared. So it really doesn't get any exposure to light. Um, and even if it does a little bit, say because it, it gets a little bit of that dusk light, uh, the phase response curve, as you can see, uh, when exposed at this period, it doesn't give you any kind of of a delay, right? Because the you can see the arrow is pointing right to where the phase response curve touches that horizontal line, which is no delay. Um, so it uh, advances again. Uh, the next day, it wakes up at 6 p.m. Now it's definitely up before, um, before the sun sets. So this little critter gets exposed to uh, light. And if we take a look at that phase response curve, the light is following. I'm looking at the fourth arrow down from the top. It's falling on that lower phase response curve right at negative 5. So it's getting light exposure that's going to cause a delay, right? because the curve is underneath the horizontal line, that will cause a delay of one half hour. So, this individual has a, has a tau of uh, 23, um, but it's going to get a delay of 5 hours, which expands the tau to 23 and a half hours. And so, what time is it right now when this animal got up? It was 6, 6 p.m., right? So, normally if it were free running, it would wake up at 5 p.m. the next day but you have to add that half hour delay. So instead of 5 p.m., it gets delayed a half hour, so it wakes up at 5.30 p.m. Oh. And so it wakes up at 5.30 p.m., starts it day, its day, so it's still, it got a little bit of a delay, but it advances naturally by an hour. So now it has ad advanced a little bit more. It's advanced a half hour now, right, because it's, its delayed tau is 23.5, which is still less than 24 hours. So this advancement of half hour nudges it just a little bit more to the left. So here we are looking at the, the one, two, three, four, five, the fifth arrow. Um, and it's pointing down, and if you follow down, it corresponds to the phase response curve that is negative one. So this is a delay of a negative one. So this animal, 5.30 in the morning, sees the bright sun in sort of the late evening, and it gets a, a one hour delay because of this light exposure during its subjective night. And so a 23 hour tell with a one hour delay gives you a 24 hour period. So now it is completely in sync. So it is going to, on the subsequent night, wake up at exactly 5.30 p.m. again. And when it does so, it's going to see light. The light uh, shines during the phase response curve of negative one hour, and it gets a delay of one hour, which 23 with a delay of one hour is 24 hours. And it wakes up again at 5.30 p.m. because it is now in sync. Its tau plus the specific delay that it needs to equal 24 hour has synced up. So now this animal is entrained. It's become 
in sync with uh, the surrounding environment. Mm -hmm. And we would say that this individual has a, a phase angle advancement of 15 degrees. So that means that this animal, to be entrained, is naturally waking up. Um, uh, no, actually, it's uh, more than that, right? Because it's waking up at 5.30, right? So it's an hour and a half. Um, so it's got an advancement of, what is that, 22 and a half degrees. Uh, and it needs that advancement every day to get the light exposure so that it can adjust its 23-hour tail to a 24-hour cycle. So this is how entrainment, how light exposure uh, and the phase response curve work together to entrain an animal. Now, some things that uh, we kind of already know, if we put together with the phase response curve, um, there are some interesting uh, variation in the phase response curve. So because advances typically have a lag, as we've seen, compared to delays, um, you can adjust, you can have different phase response curves. So if you shine a light during subjective night, it will cause an advance, but as we've seen, it'll sort of it'll slowly cause that advance over multiple nights. And so you could record just a little bit of advance that it gets that first cycle, which you can see here is day one. But if you add it all up until the advance is complete, um, and in this case, in the graph, that took five days, uh, you can get that displacement, and that's, a, that's usually a, um, a larger amplitude of displacement. And so because phase delays don't really have this lag, the, the phase response curves will actually kind of look like um, there is no variation in the delay or the curve underneath that horizontal line, uh, but there are multiple parallel uh, amplitude lines for the advancement, and that accounts for the delay. Um, and phase response curves are, we see quite a bit of variation among different individuals of the same species and among different species. Um, but what we see is the general pattern of early subjective night causes delays and late subjective night causes advances. The degree and the exact timing of these advances uh, will, will differ depending on the species and the individual. Uh, and this is just another example here on the right. Uh, these are two different phase response curves for two different flying squirrels. So well, you can get quite a bit of variation uh, within a species. So um, uh, are there limits to entrainment? What we have here on the, on the right is a phase response curve that's drawn from all these different points of an experiment of having an animal in dark dark and giving them light exposure at different sub times during their subjective circadian time um, and then measuring the advancement or the delay right and so you can see it's actually kind of messy kind of parallels what we did in class where there was you know it wasn't a perfect the dots didn't all fall along a perfect line here mm -hmm. uh, and that's typically the uh, typically the case um, and so but there are uh, we can just look at the phase response curve and understand that there are limits to uh, delays and advancement, uh, and by extension, limits to entrainment. And so could this animal here with this phase response curve, could it entrain to a tau, uh, sorry, to a T of 27 hours? So if we brought them in the laboratory and gave them a light dark cycle that had a period of 27 days, uh, 27 hours, would they be able to entrain if they had a 23 and a half hour tau? So if they want to entrain to 27 hours, right, um, they have a really fast cycle, and so it needs to be stretched out, it needs to be delayed, and it needs to be delayed by three and a half hours. So let's take a look at the response curve. Is that even possible? Can they get a three and a half hour delay? Uh, and it looks like they can. There's one single point that gave a delay of a little bit over two, but the average phase response curve seems to, uh, to end even before a two hour delay. So this phase response curve isn't anywhere close 
to a negative three and a half, being able to give a negative three and a half hour delay. So this animal would be impossible for them to entrain to this 20, they, this 27 hour, they would reach the maximum of about two hour delay, which would give them 25 and a half hours. And they just could never get there. They would never be able to sync up with this 27 hour period. Okay, so that wraps up our uh, phase response curve uh, lecture. And the next one is going to begin our dual, uh, discussing the dual oscillation cycle or the dual oscillation model.